So good morning, everybody. So uh, welcome to this tenth edition of uh, DART. Uh, so we're very pleased here at Clinic to welcome you all. Uh, so Alex Zay couldn't be here uh, for the morning session, but he's going to be here in the afternoon. Uh, so I hope you uh, we have a nice pro program set up uh, by the program committee. I hope you have a nice conference, and it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Michael Butler. And he'll speak about solving difference equation in sequences. Yeah, so thanks a lot uh, to the organizers for inviting me to, to talk here. And uh, the honor to be the, the first speaker of, uh, of this talk. So I'll talk about uh, a joint paper with uh, Glad Pogudin and Tom Scanlon. And so the outline of the talk is uh, fairly plain. So I'll first talk about some uh, well-known uh, old results, and uh, then I'll talk about our new results. So I'd like to start with uh, reminding you what a system of algebraic difference equations is. It's something similar to a system of algebraic equations. It's just that you also have uh, sigmas in there. So this is uh, an example of a system of algebraic difference equations. So here you have two equations, and you also have uh, two variables, y and z. And <clears throat> or so maybe an another way to, to say what a system of algebraic difference equations is, is to say it, it's the same thing as a system of algebraic differential equations, it's just that instead of a derivation, you have uh, a sigma. And this sigma, it has to be interpreted as a ring endomorphism. Okay. So if you want to evaluate an expression like this one, so you need to plug in values for y, you need to plug in values for c, but then you also need to, to specialize sigma. So you need to say what, what sigma is, and it has to be, so abstractly it only has to be a ring endomorphism. So uh, for example, um, in, yeah, in, in this example, maybe if you first just look at the the second equation, so I claim here that if you plug in for y cosine of x and if you plug in for z the sine of x and if you plug in for sigma this endomorphism here which stands f of x to f of 2x then you find that indeed this tuple here is a solution to the system of algebraic difference <coughs> equation. Okay, so let's just maybe look at the, the second equation. So you look at the second equation. So for y, you plug in cosine of x. And for c, you plug in sine of x. And so for sigma of c, you have to plug in sine of 2x. And so this difference polynomial here corresponds to this trigonometric identity. So you know this, this identity is true. And so at least for a second equation, you see that indeed cosine of x and sine of x is a solution. You can also do it for the, for the first equation, but okay, it's also just some trigonometric identity, but of, in this case, it's, it's, it's just more, more complicated. So you see it's important um, 
to understand it, you also need to specialize sigma. For example, if here sigma would act like by saying mapping f of x to f of x plus 1, the cosine of x and sine of x would no longer be a, be a solution. So to make sense of what a solution is, you need to specify the, the, two, the tuple, and also you need to specify a, a different string containing the tuple. So a different string is simply a commutative ring together with an endomorphism. Okay, so you need to specify a different string to evaluate these difference polynomials. So this, this kind of expressions, that's what we call difference polynomials. So this system, so that's that's what system of algebraic difference equations is, and these systems, these are the central topic in in different algebra. Okay, so there's some the natural questions you can ask about this system. So maybe the the most obvious question is: so given the system, does it have a solution? And so if it has a solution, you can ask: okay, how many solutions does it have? Maybe just uh, finitely many. Maybe typically. You have infinitely many, and then you can ask how maybe how can you quantify how many solutions it has? Is there some kind of notion of dimensions for solution sets of, of this equation? Yeah, so this is what at least people in difference algebra think what a system of algebraic difference equations is. But then if you maybe if you ask Google what Google thinks a system of algebraic difference equations is, you'll see there's no sigmas coming up in the in the answer. And apparently, so like 99% of mathematicians think that a system of difference equations is something like this. Okay, and difference algebra has surprisingly little to say about difference equations in, in this sense. Okay, and so the, the paper with, with Clapp and Tom is somehow, it fits into a, a larger project which is trying to make difference algebra more relevant to difference equations in. <coughs> In this sense. Okay, so let me also maybe just explain how to pass from this system to this somehow more explicit system. So all you do is so maybe just look at the at the second equation. So all you do is replace y by yn and you replace c by cn, and the sigma you have to replace it with the shift in the in the index. Yeah, so for example, here sigma to the five y, you replace it by y to the n plus. And the other structure you just mean you retain it. So you see in, big, in particular you see this this process is uh, reversible. So the info, the mathematical content of this first system is really the same as the mathematical content of the second system. So that the meaning of rewriting the system without the sigmas but with this shift in the indices, it really just means that you're looking for solutions of this system of algebraic difference equations. In the ring of sequence theory. So this is the, the main topic of the talk. We try to say something about this kind of difference equation. So again, you can ask the, actually the same questions you can ask. Given a system like this, does it have a solution? So does it have a solution in the ring of sequence theory? Or maybe another related question is: so here you have these two equations. Maybe you have, if you're if supposed to given a third equation, a third expression like this, you can ask if the third expression vanishes on all solutions of these two equations. And you can ask maybe, okay, can I find an algorithm that decides whether or not a, an expression similar to this one vanishes on all solutions of, of, of these two equations. So this is the type of question we would look at. And so to put things into context, I'll first uh, recall what uh, classical difference algebra has to say about systems of algebraic difference equations. So this is all, so everything I'll say here is in, is in Korn's book, but I'll, I'm, I guess most of it was already known to, to read. Okay, so I, I fixed a difference field. So like I said before, a difference ring is simply a commutative ring with an endomorphism, and usually we call it endomorphism sigma. We also say sigma ring instead of difference ring. So a difference field is just a field together with an endomorphism. And so we look at the difference polynomial ring. So, the diff so you already seen examples of difference polynomials before in the previous slide. So the difference polynomial ring is a polynomial ring in infinitely many variables. So it's a polynomial ring 
in the variables y1, yn, sigma y1, sigma yn, sigma squared y1, and so on. Okay, so I'll, I'll just denote it here with the k, k1. And so this ring, it naturally has an action of, of sigma. So on k, you already have, it, have the sigma. And then you extend the action of sigma just in the way it is suggested by the names of the, of the variables. Okay, so in this way, this so-called difference polynomial ring, it becomes a difference ring. Okay, and now we fix some, just some set of difference polynomials. So yeah, this is also what we call a system of algebraic difference equations. So in, in practice, we're mostly interested in the case when f is finite, but at least here it could also be infinite. Okay. And so we're interested in a solution of uh, such a system. So this is really what difference algebra is about. But then when you start talking about solutions, you need to specify where you're looking for the solution. And classical difference algebra is only interested in solutions in difference field extension. Okay. So I have my, I have my system. And then I look at all solutions in all difference field extensions of my base difference field. And then I can look at all difference polynomials which vanish at all these solutions. Okay. And so this is what I call I of V of F. So I start with my system. I look at all solutions in all different field extensions. Then I look at all different polynomials vanishing on all these solutions. Okay, so it's clear that if I take an element from, from F, then it will vanish on the solutions of, of F. So F itself is always contained in I of V of F. But the question is, how much more than F do you get back? Okay, so typically, it's, it's going to be more. And the answer to that question is, it's the strong Nullstellen satz, and it exactly tells you what you get back, and namely what you get back is the so-called perfect closure. So it, the perfect closure of f is denoted uh, with this uh, curly bracket. Okay, so let me explain you what, what is the perfect closure of f. So by definition, it's the smallest perfect difference idea of the difference polynomial ring that contains f. Okay, so I also need to say what uh, it means for a difference idea to be perfect. Yeah, so by the way, a difference idea is just an idea in a difference ring which is stable under the endomorphism. And to be perfect means that if f times sigma of f is in the idea, then already f is in the idea. Okay, so if you see this condition for the first time, maybe it uh, looks a bit curious, but the reason why this, uh, this condition uh, comes up is, uh, is easy to explain. So they, this really comes from uh, the fact that you're looking for solutions in fields. So if you have an equation like this in a different field, you'll see that, okay, so a field is an integral domain, so either f is zero, okay, let's say if f is zero, okay, we have, okay then f is zero, but if, uh, if sigma of f is zero, then you see that uh, on a field, an endomorphism is always injected. Okay, so if sigma of f is zero, then also f is zero. Okay, so no, no matter what, no matter what's the case, in the field, f times sigma of f is zero implies f is zero. Okay, so this is where this uh, this condition here here comes from. So it's fairly easy to see that here the the right hand side, so this perfect closure of f, is contained in this idea of v of f. And then, yeah, so the, the content of the strong, strong Nullstellen satz is that, in fact, you have uh, equality here. And so this, this strong Nullstellen satz uh, somehow also explains why uh, perfect difference ideas are so important in uh, the classical difference algebra. And so, so this perfect difference ideas, they have a uh, a lot of nice properties. So, for example, one can show that there are intersections of prime difference ideals, and also the, the classical basic theorem in difference algebra is about perfect difference ideals. It tells you that every ascending chain of perfect difference ideals in a difference polynomial ring is is fine. Okay, so that's the strong Nullstellen satz, and from the strong Nullstellen satz you get the that's a more, more or less immediate corollary 
you get also the big form of the Nordstrom set, which tells you that a system of algebraic difference equation, it has a solution in some difference field extension, even only if one does not lie in the perfect closure of it. And there's also a constructible uh, result, which goes back to, to Korn. So, we are given a finite system of algebraic difference equation and a difference polynomial, then there exists an algorithm that decides whether or not F lies in the perfect closure of uh, the given system. Okay. So recall, according to the, the strong Nordstein set, this is, so F lying in the perfect closure of F is equivalent to saying that this difference polynomial F vanishes on all solutions of the system. Okay, so this is something that, that can be decided, and it's actually a, a very nice, uh, nice algorithm. Okay, so I had a, a bachelor student um, who she, she implemented this as, uh, as part of her, her CV. Okay, so this is um, the, the classical situation. It's, uh, it's very nice. There's nothing wrong with it. But unfortunately, it doesn't tell you anything about these uh, systems of difference equations, which uh, most people care about when they talk about uh, difference equations. So it doesn't tell you anything about solutions in, in sequence X. The main point is that classically, you're only looking for solutions in, in difference field extensions. Okay, so in the, the ring of sequences, of course, it has a lot of zero devices, so you cannot embed it in any, in any difference field. So there's a, uh, uh, okay, yeah, so um, like in classical algebraic geometry or in, in differential algebraic geometry, whether or not you're only looking uh, for solutions in, in fields or solutions in rings, it doesn't make much of a difference. So for example, if you have a system of algebraic equations, <coughs> then it has a solution in a ring, even only if it has a solution in a, in a field. Okay, so this is easy to see. So for example, so if you have a solution in a, in a ring to a system of algebraic equations, then you can just pick a prime ideal and then look at the image of the solution in the residue field of the prime ideal, and this will be a solution in a field. And you can do the same thing in differential algebra. Okay, a system of algebraic differential equations, it has a solution in a ring, even only if it has a solution in a field. And the, the key ingredient is to see this, you need to know that a differential ring has a prime differential ideal. So unfortunately, that's not true in, in difference algebra. So there are difference rings that do not contain any prime difference ideal. And so maybe there, so in terms of systems, there are systems of algebraic difference equations that have no solutions in a difference field, but they have solutions in a difference ring. And so this is maybe the, the easiest example. So this is a, a system in just one variable, two equations. So this has no solution in the difference field. Because but if you look at the second equation, like we already had it here, this one implies that y is 0. Okay, But if y is 0, then also sigma of y is 0. So you get 0 is 1 in the first of equation. So that's the contradiction. But then if you rewrite this equation in the sequences formalism, then the equations just tell you that uh, if we add two, concept, two consecutive terms, then it has to the sum has to be one, and the product of two consecutive terms has to be zero. And uh, then you see that, for example, this sequence is a solution. Okay, so this system has no solution in a difference field, but it has a solution in a in a difference field. So in difference algebra, when you restrict to solutions in in fields. You lose a lot of uh, information. You just use a lot. Okay, and so there's a very nice paper um, from Alekhri of Shinnikov, Gleb Bogudin, and, and Tom Skender. It's a fairly recent paper. I think it was uh, accepted in the Journal of the European Math Society. And they deal with uh, solutions of systems of difference equations in sequences. Okay, so I'll now summarize the, the main results. So we assume now that the, 
the base difference field is algebraically closed. So this is it's not, it's not an important restriction. Um, it's, let's just say it's make the presentation simpler. And so we also assume that uh, the system is is finite. And so we we're interested in solutions in uh, sequences. So the difference ring of sequences, I'll just write it like this. So k to the n is the ring of sequences in k. So this is a, a ring with component-wise addition and multiplication of sequences. So it has a lot of zero divisors. And the endomorphism is just the, the, the map that uh, shifts the sequence one step to the left. Okay, and so for completeness, I should also say how k is uh, contained in the ring of sequences. And uh, in general, the, the way to do this is to map an element from k to consider it as a sequence via this map. So lambda maps to sigma to the n of lambda where n ranges over all natural numbers. So maybe if you see this the first time, it, it looks a bit technical. But probably the, the most important case to, to keep in mind is, say, if K would just be, say, the field of complex numbers with uh, sigma d identity. Or well, in general, if K is just any field with sigma d identity, which is somehow maybe a, a very important special case, then you just map lambda. So you just consider a field element as the, the constant sequence. And so this is what, what we somehow implicitly already did in the, in the previous example. Sorry. Yeah? If sigma is a map from K to K, Oh yeah. Okay. So so it's some it's somehow it's a little bit of abuse, which is very common in difference algebra. So basically, any endomorphism is called sigma. Okay. So we just use sigma for every endomorphism. And usually, once you get used to, so once you accept this fact, it doesn't cause any confusion anymore. So um, <laughs> so there is a sigma on K. So K is just an algebraically closed field with a given endomorphism. But then also on K to the n. I define a completely uh, different sigma, which has nothing to do with the original sigma. Okay. But then, I also define this map from k to the ring of sequences. And so this, this here is using the, the sigma on, on the k. And then actually, one, one can check that this map is a morphism of difference ring, meaning that it computes which the action of sigma on, on both sides. Okay, and so they have a, a weak Knudsen-Satz result. So they show that the system has a solution in the ring of sequences if and only if one does not lie in the difference ideal generated by n. So those uh, brackets here, they denote the so-called difference ideal generated by f. So it can abstractively define as the smallest difference ideal that contains f but more explicitly, you can also describe it as the idea generated by f, sigma of f, sigma squared of f, and so on. And they also have a, a constructive result. So they show that given a finite system of difference equations, then there exists an algorithm that decides whether or not um, yeah, one lies in, in this difference idea. Or equivalently, according to the weak notion that so they show that yeah, essentially they show that the consistency of the system can can be checked. So you have an algorithm that decides whether or not this a given system has a solution in the ring of sequences. And the idea for the algorithm is, is fairly simple. So let me let me explain it. So you see if one if one lies in, in this idea. You can write it as a linear combination of elements from f, sigma of f, the square of f, and so on. But it's, it's a finite linear combination. So clearly, you only need to go up to some, some finite, <coughs> finite power of sigma. So say, yeah, you only need to go to some maximal power of sigma. And what they show is, they show, yeah, they give a bound on this maximal power of sigma you need to write one as a linear combination. And the bound is in terms of theta, which you can easily read off from f, like the degree of the polynomials in f, or the highest power of sigma, 
occurring in the in the difference polynomials in time. So if one <coughs> so they show that if, if one lies in here, then it already lies in some uh, ideal generated by this this kind of element where you only have to go to a, a fixed uh, predetermined uh, power of sigma. And so the, the problem of this uh, difference ideal membership um, reduces to the ideal, to the classical ideal membership problem in a, in a polynomial ring in finitely many variables. And this is, of course, known how, how this works. If you can do this, for example, you can do it using program So this, this paper really was the uh, the starting point for for our paper. So there's some <clears throat> some natural questions uh, that come up, which you could how you could try to to generalize those uh, those results. So for example, maybe the most obvious question is: so they have a, a weak Neustadt such you can ask, okay, how about the how about the strong Neustadt such? But then also here, so they have an algorithm which which tests if one lies in the difference idea generated by f. Maybe you can improve this um, to testing whether or not a given difference polynomial lies in the difference idea generated by f. OK, so this completes the, the first part of my talk. And now I'll talk about the, the results in, in our journal. OK, let's first talk about the, the strong Dusch and such. So again. We fix a algebraically closed difference field, and we fix a system f of algebraic difference equations, so it can be finite or, or infinite. And so, recall first that uh, in in, this, in, the, in cones and in the, so in the classical setup of corn and drip, we looked at all solutions of the system in all difference field extensions of f. So sort of, of the base field K. And so now, here we just look at all solutions of the system in the ring of sequences in K to the N. Okay. So given the system of algebraic difference equations, we look at all solutions in sequences, and then we look at all difference polynomials that vanish on all the solutions in the sequences. Okay. And the question is, what, what is what, what do you get back? So of course, again, F itself will be in there. F vanishes on all solutions of, uh, of F. But how much more do you, do you get back? And so this is the, then the content of the strong rule that ends up. It exactly tells you what you get back. And so at least if K is uncountable, then what you get back is the radical of the difference ideal generated by F. Also, this right hand side, you could also describe it as the, the smallest <coughs> radical difference idea containing f. Okay, so maybe the, the radical difference closure of, of f. And so it's a little funny that here this, uh, this condition, with k being uncountable, comes up. But it actually, so maybe let me go back, it actually came up in, in a proof of, uh, of the weak Nullstellen such already. So yeah, this is actually, uh, I think, quite interesting. So the weak Nullstellen such, if, uh, if k is um, uncountable, the proof is, uh, is fairly straightforward. So when we looked at this, so we looked at this paper in, the, in, the, in our seminar in, uh, in Notre Dame, that and then he said, oh, this is just saturation. But um, if you look at the, at the countable case, so the, the, the proof they have is, is actually very complicated, and it uses this uh, deep result of uh, Ruschowski about uh, twisted Langweil estimates. So you don't see the, the condi any condition on the cardinality here on K in, in the statement, but actually in the proof, the proofs uh, differ according to whether or not K is uh, countable or uncountable. And in the countable case, it's much more, more complicated. And in fact, so the weak Nullstellen and such, the way it is stated here, is only known to hold for uh, for finite f. So it's it's not known, at least not to me, 
if the weak Neustadl starts hold for an infinite set f if k is uh, countable. Okay, so here they have this, uh, this statement. It holds for all algebraically closed k's, but the so the weak Neustadl satz, but for the strong Neustadl satz, we only have so in this form we only have it if if k is uh, uncountable. And in fact, we really have a counterexample if uh, if so for if k is countable. So for k equals the field of uh, yeah the algebraic closure of of Q, the field of uh, algebraic numbers, there indeed is a, is a counterexample to this uh, to this statement. And I think this so this counterexample is actually one of the the main results of of our paper. So and it's the construction of the counterexample is. Uh, is fairly involved. So we don't even give an explicit counterexample. So maybe in the end, if there's, I'll, I'll say a little bit about how we, how we construct the, the counterexample, but it's very, um, it's very implicit. So, if, so I first had a, I had a, a counterexample where f is infinite, which is maybe not so, not so hard to believe, but then Clapp has a, a very nice idea to find a, a counterexample, but even, even when f is uh, finite. Okay, so that's the, the strong notion is that it's a little unsatisfying that it only holds for uncountable case, but there's somehow easy theoretical trick to, to, to get a statement uh, for arbitrary, even for arbitrary difference fields. So I mean, like in, in, even say in practice, if you have difference equations, say in, in coefficients in Q or Q bar, you can always just consider them as difference equations with coefficients in the field of complex numbers. And then your field is uncountable, and okay, then you can use it. So there's an, an easy trick to get a statement for arbitrary difference fields. We don't even need algebraically closed. So all this. So we look at difference field k again, arbitrary system. And so now here, I allow myself not to just look for solutions in the sequences in k, but I allow my, I allow myself to look in solutions. So I look, I allow myself to look for sequences that have coefficients in some field extension. So here the K here, it doesn't even, the capital K here, it doesn't even need to be a difference field. It's just any field extension. You see that the ring of sequences, so K to the N, is, uh, is a difference ring by the sh using the shift. Even, so you don't need K to be a different, capital K to be a difference field, or K to the N to be a difference ring. Okay, so I just consider K to the N as a, as a difference ring. And so if you add this little extra freedom here, then we do the same construction again. So I look at all difference polynomials vanishing at all of all at all solutions in sequences where you the sequences are allowed to take values in extension fields, then you get this expected form of the, the strong notion set. Okay, so what you get on the right hand side is the smallest radical difference ideal containing f. So it's, it's funny because somehow, so looking for solutions in sequences gives you the same thing you get in, so in differential algebra, a very classical setup, and you're only looking for solutions in differential field extensions, this is also what you get. You get the radical of the differential ideal generated by f. So here, if you're looking for solutions in sequences, this is also what, what you get. So that's the, the strong notion. So let me also talk a bit about algorithms and decidability. So let me first recall the, the result of, of Kohl. So given the finite system, F, and given a difference polynomial, also called f, then there exists an algorithm that decides whether or not f lies in the perfect closure of f. Or, in other words, using the, the strong Neustadl set, you can decide whether or not f vanishes on all solutions in all different field extensions of uh, the system. And then the result of, of Schönigkov, Borodin, and, and Scanlon. Is uh, similar somehow similar in, in nature. Again, you're given 
finite system of <coughs> algebraic differential equations. And then there exists an algorithm, so they give an, an, an algorithm that decides whether or not one lies in radical difference that we are generated by x. So if, if you're only talking about one, it doesn't matter if you ask if one lies in the radical of the difference idea generated by f or in the difference idea generated by f, just because one to some power is still one, so it doesn't matter. So, so in terms of uh, containment, the, <coughs> the natural question to ask is, is a given difference polynomial contained in the radical <coughs> of the difference idea generated by f? Because this really corresponds to the question According to the strong notion that this corresponds to the question whether or not f vanishes on all the solutions of the system. Okay, and this is something new, which is uh, somehow interesting in, in practice. So you may think that you know, just replacing one with uh, some difference polynomial f is not it's not a it's not a big step. But it actually turns out to be a a very huge step. Like it's it's infinitely huge, you can't even take it. So in fact, it's, yeah, you can't do it. So we have a, a result um, which proves that, yeah, so we show that this problem, so you can also call it the radical difference ideal membership problem is, uh, is undecidable. So given the finite system and given the difference polynomial, you'd like to know if the difference polynomial is contained in the radical Difference idea generated by f, and it's uh, so this is undecidable. So maybe I should say a little bit about what what does it really mean to be undecidable. So decidability. So the problem is decidable essentially if there exists if there exists an algorithm, and it's undecidable if there does not exist an algorithm. And whenever we talk about decidability, we should be um, a bit more careful here. So here, I should assume that uh, the, the coefficient of all my difference polynomials, they should belong to some, say, some computable subfield of, of K. And yeah, so in, I'm, I'm not saying this on, in the, on the upcoming slide, but to have a more precise statement, you should always assume that the coefficients of the things I'm talking about belong to some computable uh, subfield. Okay, so in practice, how do you prove decidability or how you prove Undecidability. So in practice, to prove that something is decidable, that the problem is decidable, you just give the algorithm, and that's it. That is decidable. And to typically, to show that something is undecidable, you encode a problem. So to show that the problem is undecidable, you encode a problem which is known to be undecidable into your problem. And that's also how we do it here. So in fact, we, <coughs> we encode the Hilbert stands problem. Into, into this problem. So Hilbert Stenz problem asks if, if uh, a given polynomial with integer coefficients has a solution in the integers. And this is known to be undecided. Okay, so I'll say a little bit more about, um, so we have a few more undecidability <coughs> results. So this uh, this result of Schilling, uh, of Fogudin, and Scanlon, there's various ways, so there's various directions into which you can try to to generalize them. And one one way concerns the the coefficients. So they have this assumption that the, the base field is uh, algebraically closed. So for example, it could just be the the field of uh, complex number. And then you can decide whether or not if a given finite system has a solution in the sequences uh, with uh, complex entries. But then you can also ask, oh, maybe there's an algorithm that decides whether or not you have solutions in the sequences with, uh, say, real entries. So in, in applications, in practice, you, most of the, your, your system actually have uh, real entries, so you may think maybe you can also do it just with uh, real numbers instead of uh, complex numbers, but it turns out that you can't. Okay. So given a system, a <coughs> system of difference equation with uh, real coefficients, if you only ask for real solutions, so solutions in 
this string of sequences is real entries, then you can't you can't do it anymore. And another natural and I think important way to try to generalize the problem is to look at uh, partial differential equations. Instead, so everything I've talked about so far was just about ordinary differential equations, meaning there is just one endomorphism, and it was called sigma. But so it's also important to look at uh, the, yeah, so a lot of um, especially the applications, there are a lot of applications you have and um, several endomorphisms. So instead of just one endomorphism, sigma now we have, so for example, we have here this is an example where you have two endomorphisms, sigma one and sigma two. So this is a, an example of a system of partial difference equations. You have two equations, you have two variables, y and z again, but here you also have now two endomorphisms. So if you want now to rewrite this more concretely using the, the sequences notation, now you need to have uh, two indices. Uh, so you have now an m and an n index. Okay, so the, the idea how to rewrite it is the same. So y gets replaced by y m n and z gets replaced by z m n. And then say sigma 1 is the shift in the, the first index and sigma 2 is the shift in the, in the second index. Okay, now given a system of difference equations in this sense, here then you can ask again the same question. For example, the most, the most basic question you can ask is, okay, given the system, does it have a solution? So can you find an algorithm that decides whether or not <coughs> such a given system has a solution in the ring of uh, double, double index sequences? And it turns out, actually, you, you can't. Okay, so this is uh, also one of, uh, of our results. So given a finite system of uh, different equations, just say in now in two, these two sigmas, so, dub, so we're really talking about doubly indexed sequences, then even the question whether or not one lies in the, the radical difference ideal generated by F is, uh, is undecidable. So you, so, or in other words, the problem is just to decide if you have a solution in the ring of sequences now becomes uh, undecidable. And yeah, somehow more generally, you, could, um, you can also replace this n squared here by um, essentially by an arbitrary monoid. So you can think of a, of a difference ring, of a classical difference ring. Like I said, it's just a commutative ring together with an endomorphism. You can think of this as a ring together with an action of the monoid of uh, natural numbers. And so somehow to generalize different side to put in, you can just say, oh, now instead of looking at rings, rings with an action of the natural numbers, just look at rings together with an action of an arbitrary monoid. And you can try to do everything for an arbitrary monoid. And you know, some basic general nonsense goes goes through for arbitrary monoids. And yeah, so you you can ask maybe for some monoids. So yeah, so for the natural numbers you can do it. For n squared, you can't do it. Uh, but maybe for some monoids you can. And uh, so the, the model theory for uh, monoids, uh, yeah, so for, for free monoids is, is much nicer uh, than, say, for the model theory for uh, n squared. So then maybe that we had some hope that you could do it for a free monoid. But also, even if you replace n squared by a free monoid on, on two generators, yeah, the problem is, is still undecided. So I, uh, I'm not, I don't want to say too much about the proof, but I'll, I'd like to mention this lemma, which is somehow the, the heart of, uh, of two of the proofs of, uh, of our result. And so this, this lemma, it's, uh, it's used in the construction of the of the counter example. And uh, yeah, so this somehow also then explains why this uh, 
the construction of the counter example is so, so implicit. And uh, this lemma is also used in proving the undecidability of the radical difference ideal membership problem. Okay, and I'm I decided to put this to put this lemma here also because uh, yeah mainly because it somehow illustrates a connection to some somehow more dynamical problem. Okay, so let's maybe let's just look at the, the statement together first. So here we have a what we call a piecewise polynomial map. So we have a fine end space, and uh, so okay. So what is a piecewise polynomial map? For example, it could just be a polynomial map. So in each of the coordinates is given the map is given by polynomials, but a piecewise polynomial map is a bit more is a bit more general. So you allow yourself to decompose a to the n into a constructible subset, and then on each uh, constructible subset the map is given by uh, polynomials. Cool. So essentially, somehow, you're able to write down this map using finitely many polynomials, but you can use equality and also inequality. You can say, oh, yeah, so some expression. So maybe if somehow the sum of the coordinates is not equal to 1, then you do this. If the sum of the coordinates is equal to 1, then you do something else. And then we also fix a closed subset, so just the solution set of some algebraic equations. So given this data, this piecewise polynomial map and this sub variety here, then the statement of the lemma is that there exists this integer r greater or equal 1, and its finite system of difference equations, and this one difference polynomial such that these two problems are equivalent. Okay, so the second problem is simply the, the radical difference ideal membership problem. And uh, okay, so what's the first problem? The first problem is a problem about this piecewise polynomial map and this uh, sub variety. Okay, so it's talking about a sequence. So this sequence xi is a sequence of points in a fine space and it is such that well the first one the first point has to lie in v and then all the other points are obtained from the first point by repeatedly applying p okay so the sequence of the x sign is really just the, the forward orbit of x0 under iteration of, uh, of p. And then somehow the crucial question comes in the end. The question is whether or not the last index of this sequence is always non-zero. OK, so let me repeat. Given this piecewise polynomial map and this closed subset, you can ask the following question about this map and this subset, namely you can ask, does there exist a sequence such that the first term lies in V and then the rest of the sequence is just uh, this forward orbit? Yeah, so such that the last coordinate of all those points is always not zero. Okay, so this is the problem you can ask about P and V. And so given this P and V, you can find this system of algebraic difference equations and this f such that this problem about p and v is equivalent to this radical difference ideal membership problem. Okay, and so the, how we use this, this lemma then in the proof? Well, to show that, that so okay, so if, if the radical difference ideal membership problem was decidable, then also this first problem would be decidable. Okay. And so then we show, okay, this first problem is actually not decidable. And that's that's how we prove that the radical difference ideal membership problem is also not decidable. So in this in this problem here, this problem about, about this piecewise polynomial map and this closed subset, in this problem we encode uh, Hilbert's dense, dense problem.
And so maybe the, the idea to do this is, well, you can actually just choose V. Oh, you choose V just to be the origin, just the point zero. And then you can choose P roughly in such a way that if you start with the origin, it is in such, is in such that essentially it produces under iteration all tuples of uh, natural numbers. Okay, so somehow you get all the natural numbers and then you just need to add an, essentially, you just need to add one extra coordinate and at that last coordinate you, you, you put a, a given polynomial with integer coefficients which evaluates at all those tuples of integers. So that's how you encode the Hilbert stands problem in, in Jupyter. Then also for the, so this lemma is also used in the construction of the counter example. And yeah, you see then somehow you see why, yeah, this is, is, a, is the, the construction of the lemma is, so given P, the lemma is fairly explicit about how to, to find the, the system F and, uh, and the small F, but uh, is, is somehow is quite in, Okay, so I think I'll, I'll stop here. And so if you're interested, uh, that's the preprint on the iPad. So do we have any questions? If not, so I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, how can you tell if finite set of uh, different dimensions have the same solution. Yeah, so okay, it, it, this this question it really depends on on where you're looking for the for the solutions. So if if you do, if you are put yourself in the in the classical setup of of different algebra like like in Gorn's book, then uh, you 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 can do it. There's an algorithm. So so if you have so you can decide if one Polynomial, if one difference polynomial lies in the perfect difference that you have generated by um, by a given finite system, and then you just ask this question for each of so for each of uh, the elements of uh, the second system you have, and so so you can test if if two yeah so once once you can test whether or not f is in the perfect difference that you are generated by f, then you can also test if uh, if two uh, sets generate uh, the same perfect perfect difference as f. And so similarly, um, if yeah, I mean, okay, so for the radical for the radical difference ideals, we we can't do it. So we we, we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to. Given f and g, we wouldn't be able to decide. Can you say something k is not a field? No k. Um, putting conditions on the word not. Um, I don't know. I don't, not, at least not not me, not right now. So I don't think. Uh, yeah. Somehow. Yeah. You you at least somehow like to know how to deal with algebraic equations, like at the very least. So somehow you can always think of algebraic equations as being different algebraic equations. And so if you want to say something or decide something about different algebraic equations. At the very least, you should be able to, to say and decide things about algebraic equations. And so, how can you do that for more radical equations? No way. So, do you know this Penn type boy in the case of dimensions and the unique difference radical ideal? Because now, Yeah, yeah. So, so it, so the, 
the, yeah, the radical difference ideal membership problem in, uh, in differential algebra is uh, is known to be in the guide. Yeah, I think it is very classical. But as far as I'm, oh, I'm not saying something wrong, but I think the, the simply the differential ideal membership problem, I think it's, it's known to be under guide. At least if you have two derivations. Yeah, so the, the radical differential ideal membership is easier than simply the differential ideal membership. And I think this is not the answer. Any other questions? If not, that's like my turn. <laughs> we'll start again in seven minutes. This is mine, I'll just leave it here. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Do you want me to plug in mine? Yeah. Or, uh, USB? Or, USB? Or, yeah, USB? Yeah, USB. Fine. Uh, okay. Michael? Michael? Is that your USB now? <coughs> Not your USB. USB, no? <laughs> is this your thumb drive? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, this oh, is your clicker. Yeah. Oh, this is your clicker. It's my clicker. You can use it. Oh, okay. okay. Do it. Yeah, yeah. I have a backup. Should I stop? <laughs> if it runs out of batteries. Right.